Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, second webinar on the Estimates Academy for Trial Teams. My name is Judith Ansures, and I work for Roche. And the topic of today is Estimates in Oncology, How and Why. Next slide. The webinar is sponsored by the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations, FPI, and the European Federation of Statisticians in the Pharmaceutical Industry, FSPI. The next slide, please. It was organized by the Estimate Implementation Working Group. We are a group of clinicians and statisticians when representing more than 22 industry partners and health authorities. And we gathered to discuss our experience on implementing the estimate framework in our companies. And we tried to give recommendations to the field. Um, with that, I would like to hand over to Kaspar, who will introduce the content of the webinar. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Judith. So my name is uh, Kaspar Rubibach. I work uh, also for Roche in Basel, and I am involved in the Oncology Estimates Working Group. But before I start providing some details on the working group, um, uh, just a disclaimer, the opinions that are voiced here are those of the presenters and not necessarily the views of the respective companies. Um, if you have questions on the content and would like to discuss, then please add them to the Q&A functionality from Zoom. And we very much invite you to add questions. And uh, we hope this will be as interactive as yesterday's uh, webinar. So please, please uh, just raise your questions and then we will either answer them during the discussion or we will answer them in writing uh, as much as we can. If you have uh, questions on more technical aspects, how to run Zoom or you face some challenges, uh, please uh, use the chat functionality for these kind of questions. Next slide, please. So the, the Oncology Estimates Working Group is very happy to contribute to the, today's webinar. And this working group has been founded uh, in early 2018 in order to make the high level principles that are described in the ICHE9 addendum concrete for people working on clinical trials to kind of bridge that gap between high level principles and what, what do we need to do in our clinical trials now with these uh, estimate principles. So the goal of the working group is to generate a common understanding across industry. And for that, we gathered uh, many colleagues in industry. So as of April, the working group had 61 members globally uh, representing 33 companies. And we, in some sense, represent industry as we are official scientific working groups of FSPI in Europe and of the ASA biopharmaceutical section. Uh, in the US. Uh, we also are lucky enough to have informal in, uh, regular interactions with eight health authorities globally, basically sharing with them the work we are doing and provide, they then provide input and, and feedback and what additional questions they still have, which we then take back and continue to work on. Uh, if you're interested to learn more about the uh, Oncology Estimates Working Group, I invite you to browse to our webpage uh, onquestdemand.org, and that will also be the place where we will um, store the today's slide deck after the event. Next slide, please. So today we are very excited to have uh, uh, um, uh, the following colleagues on the panel, which provide their view and their input and also uh, guide you through the presentation. So uh, myself, I will uh, contribute to the panel discussion. Here I would also like to mention Evgeny Dektyarev, with whom I co-founded this working group uh, three and a half years ago. He, uh, I think, has also dialed in today, and he might also provide his view um, during the discussion. Then Stefan is leading the clinical engagement task force within the on demand working group and is contributing to the presentation and panel discussion today. Jia Wei is part of the uh, presentation team. Then we also are lucky enough to have a clinical colleague, Giovanna Andreola, today contributing. Um, we have Paul Baikett, uh, Feng Liu, uh, Sami Tang, and uh, Jonathan Siegel. Next slide, please. So our thanks go to the FPI FSPI. Uh, working group on implementation of the estimates addendum for sponsoring and promoting the webinar. 
and to all the working group members for the lively discussion, comments on the slides and the work over the years that finally uh, led to our current status of, of, of knowledge of expertise, if you want. Um, after the event today, uh, we hope that you can recognize the benefits of applying the estimate uh, framework as put forward in the addendum in the context of a clinical trial in order to have a common language to describe uh, all the patient journeys that can happen in a clinical trial and to make sure we address the right questions in a clinical trial. We also hope that you will have learned how to construct an estimate, uh, including identification, identification of the relevant intercurrent events and that you have an idea about the relevant strategies to address the intercurrent events. And we also hope that you gain some insight from our knowledge that we have uh, accumulated over the years, so from our cross-industry international working group on estimates in oncology. And with this, I am more than happy to hand over to Chai Wei to introduce the case study. Thank you, Kespa. Um, hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me clearly. So this is Jia Wei from Novartis, and uh, I'm going to introduce you the motivating example, Checkmate 37, uh, that will be revisited later. So the study drug in the Checkmate 37 is a nivolumab, which is an immune checkpoint inhibitor. And Checkmate 37 investigated treatments for patients with advanced melanoma who experienced disease progression with eflimumab and a uh, BRAF inhibitor. And at the start of the trial, eplimumab and the BRAF inhibitor were the only approved agents for the treatment of advanced melanoma. So in this randomized controlled open label phase three trial, patients were random, randomly assigned in a two to one ratio to the nivolumab arm and investigator's choice chemotherapy arm as reference. So this was an open label design study because the different toxicity profiles of the comparators made it impossible to use a blinded approach. And there were two primary objectives. One was to compare the overall survival of the nivolumab versus chemotherapy, which was based on a comparison of all patients um, followed. And the other uh, was to assess the objective um, response rate, namely ORR, uh, within the nivolumab group, which was a non-comparative assessment. And if the pre-specified threshold was achieved, the sponsor will file for accelerated approval with the FDA. So here are some further details about the two primary endpoints. So the overall survival was defined as the time from randomization until death from any cause. So we know that the survival is considered um, the most reliable cancer endpoint and is usually the preferred endpoint. It is also a golden standard from the patient's perspective. And now if we turn to the accelerated approval endpoint, the ORR, which is used as an early indi indicator of anti-cancer activity. It was defined as the proportion of patients who had achieved an objective response, including the complete response or partial response. And complete response is defined as disappearance of all disease and partial response is defined as at least a 30% decrease in tumor burden from baseline. So for completeness, two other categories are defined uh, by the resist and show here um, that are not part of the objective response rate. So the progressive disease is defined as new disease or at least 20% increase in tumor burden and the stable disease is defined as none of the other. So now let's uh, look at the results on the objective response rate ORR. So in the nivolumab group, a non-comparative assessment of ORR after 120 patients had been treated with nivolumab and followed up for at least 24 weeks was performed. So where the 120 patients were selected so that the lower limit of the 95% confidence interval did not include the pre-specified threshold of 15% or less. So we see the ORR in the nivolumab group was 31.7% with a 95% confidence interval in excluding the threshold of 15%. And this was also performed OR analysis in the patients enrolled in the uh, chemotherapy group uh, on 47 patients and the ORR in the chemotherapy group was 10.6%. 
Uh, so based on this result and uh, the expected confirmatory evidence from mature data from this trial or other trials during the same period, FDA granted accelerated approval for the Nivolumab. And later, uh, four approvals were granted in US, EU, and Japan based on additional readouts from other trials. Um, of course, all this happened prior to overall survival analysis. Uh, and in the meantime, the company continued, continued followed overall survival for its uh, maturity. So um, next slide, please. So here are the overall survival results based on a comparison of all randomized patients. The following are Kaplan-Meier curves of overall survival for all randomly assigned patients. Blue represents the nivolumab group and the yellow represents the chemotherapy group. So we cannot tell difference from the two curves. The analysis tells us that the median over survival was 15.7 months in the nivolumab group and 14.4 months in the chemotherapy group with a uh, with a hazard ratio 0.95, which is very close to one, indicating no difference. So from this result, we see that nivolumab did not reflect significant efficacy in overall survival time, which leads to the dilemma that drug approved by an intermediate endpoint ORR did not show survival benefit by mature survival data, as shown in the publication here by uh, Lee Lawrence et al. Next slide, please. Well, for those who are in oncology, we know this is not unusual and the difference could happen between this intermediate objective response rate and the long-term survival. Um, however, for the uh, general public, um, they may not uh, realize or appreciate this difference. As the headlines showed here, David et al. said in the BMJ that most approved oncology drugs do not show survival benefit. And in fact, the data show that over half of the 48 cancer drugs approved by the European Medicine Agency between 2009 and 2013 had no benefit in terms of survival or quality of life. So similar conclusion was also published in other journals as shown here, I'm not going to uh, read them all, but these negative perceptions and the misconceptions reinforce the need to think more carefully about the questions we are really trying to address and the estimation uh, goals. So now let's go back to the checkmate 37 and take a deep look to see what happens to the actual treatment intake after randomization. So we see a total of four or five patients in a two to one ratio, 272 in the nivolumab group and the 133 in the chemotherapy group. However, a much higher percentage of patients randomized to chemotherapy did not receive treatment compared to those randomized to nivolumab. As 29 of whom withdraw their constant be before starting treatment. And in contrast, only four patients in the nivolumab group did not receive treatment. While this is not unusual for an open-label study, together with the fact that several competing studies investigating other checkpoint inhibitors were running concurrently at the time of trial entry. So patients want to do the best they can as long as they were randomized to chemotherapy arm, uh, very likely they will withdraw from the study. And in addition, there is another uh, complication. The post-treatment discontinuation rate due to other checkpoint inhibitor therapy uh, received is also very high. At least the 41% chemotherapy arm received another checkpoint inhibitor therapy, while in Volumab, it's about uh, uh, 10%. So now there are two observations here. Patient opted out of the prescribed treatment and the post-treatment discontinuation due to other checkpoint inhibitor therapy which has the tendency to dilute the treatment effect. And later for this trial, a post hoc analysis was published. So what the sponsors did, they performed a survival analysis with all treated patients. And they censored the survival data at the start of other checkpoint inhibitor treatment. So with the recognition of possible selection bias uh, of these patients, the median survival time was 16.4 months in the nivolumab group and 11.8 months in the chemotherapy group. And with a risk ratio of uh, point, uh, sorry, has a ratio of 0.81, which is much better than the results of the previous uh, primary analysis. And now if we look at the Kaplan-Meier curve from, uh, for this post hoc analysis, we can also um, see a 
obvious difference between the two groups. So what are these different results telling us? Whether there is a survival benefit in Checkmate 37 or not, and it, the post hoc analysis actually answer a different research question of interest, which might be what was originally intended but not clearly described. So we may know the answer after hearing uh, Stefan introduce the SMM framework. So back to Stefan. Yeah, thanks, Jiu Wei. So before we dive into the, the, the theory, uh, we want to show you a discussion that we had um, also in our group, and that is mirrored in this comic. So that's a very great example, Jiu Wei, that you just showed. But I think it, the, the issue in Checkmate is not necessarily what is seen in a typical study. Our clinical trial is aligned to agreed objectives. So show me your meaning for description of the treatment effect. Well, that's easy. The, the objectives are defined in section three of the protocol. The, the endpoints are later defined in the protocol and uh, the handling of the special events is then described somewhere in the statistical analysis plan. At least uh, that's my understanding. And then after you put all these pieces together, you will know what we actually wanted. Are you sure your study team, your management, and the regulators always come to the same conclusion? Well, even if not, we're able to perform additional analysis to fulfill all the needs. Well, as long as we've collected the data to, to do so. Well, seems like a lot of additional work to me. Well, fair enough. If only we had a structured framework that fully aligns the trial with the clinical objectives. It's already here. It's called the estimate framework. Okay. And that is what we'll introduce now. So I'm happy to introduce the ICHE9 R1 um, estimate um, framework, which was published as an addendum to the ICHE9 guidance. And it really promotes the alignment between trial objective, design, data collection, conduct, analysis, and inference. And uh, the, the hope is that it increases the transparency and also then provides more trust in the biopharmaceutical industry. It should strengthen the interdisciplinary dialogue at the design stage, um, reduces the risk of different interpretations by making it very transparent on what we're targeting. And it also then should align the data collection with what we try to target, it should align the expectation between drug developers and regulatory bodies. And one of the core concepts is that we need a very precise definition of the trial objective and the meaningful treatment effect. And that is all combined in uh, the estimate. So what is an estimate? Um, the estimate is what we want to find out, and it needs to be precisely described. Um, it follows directly from the, the, it should follow directly from the trial objective. So this should be a top-down process. So you should align on what is the envisioned trial objective that you want to show with your study. And then you define precisely what you want to estimate. And that is your estimate. And then you design your study to collect all the necessary data to, to be able to find that out. And then you apply a statistical method to estimate this. And that is the main estimator. And then you plug in your data into that statistical model, and then you uh, get the main estimate. That is the numerical outcome. And often we perform sensitivity analysis to assess um, the robustness of the statistical model. And that would then mean that you have a sensitivity estimator for the same estimate, as well as a sensitivity estimate. And ideally, that is a top-down process. Sometimes you need to consider um, if the study design is possible. So sometimes you have to repeat this for um, different estimates and then really pick uh, the right estimate for your study as well as that aligns to your trial objective. 
with that, I would uh, remind everyone of uh, the soup analogy that was uh, presented in the first webinar. Um, in the first webinar, um, we also introduced the estimate together with its uh, five components, and we will uh, repeat them again in the next slides. And you can think of the estimate as the, the recipe of your soup together with its ingredients, meaning the, the components of the estimate. And the recipe describes, well, what type of soup will we have? And then the estimator, which are the statistical models, um, it, the analogy is the estimator defines how you cook the soup. So, and when you then cook the soup, in the end, you get your result, the tasty soup. And that is um, the same result as the estimate, because the estimate is the numerical result that follows the statistical model methods and that follows the what uh, we want to ask, like what we want to target in our study. And I think that a distinction is very helpful. So the estimate is the what. And the estimator, with, together with the estimate, is the how and the numerical outcome. Um, we have quickly touched on the five components of the estimate. And these are very important, so we will repeat them from the first webinar. Uh, the first three is the population, the variable, the treatment conditions. Um, we have used these terms uh, in, in our study protocols. And I think their, their definition was a bit precise with the amendment. So the population is who we want to study. It's um, the population that you include in your study is defined by the inclusion and exclusion criteria. But as we will see later on in the presentation, the population is not fully defined by your inclusion exclusion criteria. It could also extend this population uh, with like estimation methods or how we treat additional events. So it's really the target population where your study wants to make an assessment for. The variable is defined as the endpoint for an individual trial participant. And there, the clarification with the amendment is that an endpoint refers to an individual trial participant. So some of what we have called endpoints before in oncology um, would not target an individual participant. So just keep that in mind that this is the clarification with the addendum. Um, and the Last aspect is treatment conditions. Note that it's not the treatment, it's the treatment conditions, which can include additional factors. And we will see that. So it can include the active drug versus the placebo, additional background medication, as well as rescue medication. So it's really the complete treatment course that the subject uh, experienced. So whereas we have often used these three components in, in prior protocols, the estimate framework introduces additional ones, which, um, which one is, is like a lot of discussion and the addendum is around strategies for intercurrent events. And we will dive deep into intercurrent events with the next slides. And these are these are events that will impact um, the interpretation of our outcome. And examples in oncology is like anti-drug antibodies, surgical removal, treatment discontinuation, or treatment switching. And we will um, have some more example of intercurrence events. The last component of the estimate is the population level summary. And that can be a mean, a median, a response rate, or a hazard ratio. There are more examples possible, but it's, it's how you want to describe it uh, for your population. And these are the five components of the estimate. So the population, the variable, the treatment conditions, the intercurrent events, and the population level summary. The aspect that here um, has taken most of uh, 
the attendance is uh, intercurrent events as well as strategies to address them. So the ICHE9 addendum glossary definition of intercurrent events is events occurring after treatment initiation that either prevent the observation of the variable or affect its interpretation. Well, what does that mean? I think it's, it's easier to understand that if we have a look at patient profiles that you see in the middle. So you see here six uh, stylized patients that all start their drug. And if you look at patient one, that patient one withdrew from treatment directly after uh, start. And then was either on subsequent therapy or no therapy. So you see there we have an event of withdrawal from treatment. And we would consider this as an intercurrent event because it might um, affect our interpretation of the study. You see subject two who was on drug from the beginning of the study until the end. Then we have patient three who started the drug, then withdrew from treatment and later died um, on subsequent or no therapy. We see patient four who uh, took subsequent therapy sometime during the course of the study. Same for patient four five, which took subsequent therapy a bit earlier. And we have patient six who died uh, while on drug. So you see that they're quite diverse and uh, we have there identified three intercurrent events that we would like to, uh, that we would need to address according to the ICH-9 addenda. And the Estimate framework especially highlights that it's necessary not only to identify the events, but also to understand the actual reasons for the intercurrent events, because these events might have an impact um, also on the, uh, the interpretation of the study, but they can also have an interpretation on what data we need to collect. And the idea is to, to have a cross team alignment in the beginning and pre-plan in close collaboration with the study team members on these um, intercurrent events and their, their strategies. And we will discuss the strategies that we can apply to them in the next couple of slides. And here's really important to pre-plan them um, and mention them in your study protocol and then act accordingly. So whereas we now know what, uh, what the intercurrent events are, we now go deeper into the strategies. And to be able to do this, we will really look at a stylized uh, study. So we have here a study comparing drug X with control for these six patients. They were randomized either to drug X or control. They received drug, um, in regular intervals and as in oncology, we had uh, scans performed and the outcomes of the scans were as Jue highlighted were either a complete response, partial response, stable disease or progressive disease. And we looked at the same endpoint as checkpoint, uh, which is best overall response and best overall response in oncology is best response ever occurred in the study. So if you follow patient one, he had stable disease, stable disease followed by partial response. So the best response would be partial response. For patient two, we see um, a PR, partial response, CR, complete response followed by complete response. So the best response would be complete response. And patient three has stable disease, stable disease, and then uh, progressive disease, so the best response was a stable disease. Um, and you will see that the exact same um, assessments occurred for the control group. So we have PR, CR, and SD as best responses in the control group as well. Okay, so on face value, these two drugs appear similar, control and drug X. But what happens if we introduce a, a single intercurrent event, which is the take of subsequent therapy? And 
we introduce that and we see that patient four had um, taken some sequence therapy after the second scan and patient five has taken some sequence therapy after the first scan. So um, I think it's fair to argue that our treatment effect might be influenced by that. And the question now is, how do, do we interpret these data? And there, the ICH9 addendum helps us as well. If we have identified an intercurrent event, it gives us five strategies for addressing the intercurrent event. Um, you will hear, you always see on the top, a more verbal explanation of the strategy and in the, the bottom, uh, which I'll show soon, is the ICHE9 defined term, which we should remember. So the first strategy for the intercurrent event is we can analyze our data irrespective of. So we take, and I think that's the important point, we take an active decision to um, analyze this irrespective of. So we, which means our outcome after the intercurrent event is still of interest, which also means we should collect the data after the intercurrent event. And in ICAG9 addendum, this is described as the treatment policy strategy. And this treatment policy strategy is also connected uh, with the ITT principle. So what would happen in, in our study if we apply the treatment policy strategy? Well, we would get the same results as before because we analyze this um, irrespective of the intercurrent event. And both groups would look identical. But what has happened? So we're, when we look at the treatment attribute of the estimate, this has changed because the treatment effect that we're now looking at is irrespective of subsequent therapy. Or we could say our treatment is the study treatment plus optional or potential subsequent therapy. So we're really looking at a different treatment paradigm that we're assessing here. In this case, um, we would include subsequent therapy into the treatment conditions attribute of the estimate. The next strategy that the ICAG9 addendum gives us is to include the intercurrent event in the outcome. So define a composite endpoint that includes the intercurrent event. Um, that is with the assumption that the intercurrent event is informative of the effect of interest. And this inclusion in the outcome is defined as a composite strategy in the ICH9 addendum. So how would this be reflected in, in this? So we see now um, that patient four and five had this intercurrent event, and we would include this in the outcome. So their final outcome would be that they had this intercurrent event, which we would treat as non-responders. For, for example, in the overall response rate analysis. And that modifies our variable because we now include the intercurrent event into the variable definition. So if subsequent therapy is considered an undesirable outcome in our study, um, we could include this into the endpoint. The next strategy that ICH9 addendum gives us is we take a scenario in which the event does not occur. And if you look at this scenario, then this is a hypothetical strategy because it's a, a strategy that is envisioned in which the intercard event would not occur. So um, something that we can only achieve through inference. And that is called the hypothetical strategy in the ICH-9 addendum. So what does that mean? So for our study, if we'll look in a scenario where we want to see what would have happened if the intercurrent event had not occurred, uh, which would mean we would need to predict or impute the responses um, if subsequent therapy was not available. So in a case where the subjects would not have received subsequent therapy, and then we can predict the outcome. 
we normally predict a couple of times uh, to include the uncertainty. So for patient four, um, we may predict that he continued on SD or that he improved to a partial response or even to a complete response. And that will depend on the model that we apply. The same for patient five. We can either predict that patient five stayed on a partial response or improved to a complete response. And here, uh, this is reflected as a strategy how to address the intercurrent event. And in the estimate attribute, this would go into the bucket of how we handle the intercurrent event. And we would then describe this as where we are targeting as if subsequent therapy was not available. And that would then be our primary point of interest. And that is a hypothetical strategy per the ICH-9 addendum. The next strategy that ICH-9 highlights is a strategy uh, that we would call prior to the occurrence of the intercurrent event. So the scientific question then uh, should be about what happened prior to the intercurrent event, which also means that the outcome after the intercurrent event is considered irrelevant. And in such a strategy, I would like to add that this could also then influence your data collection strategy, because if you're not interested in the outcome after the event, you could then also stop data collection for this endpoint if this is not needed also for any of the secondary endpoints. And the ICH-9 addendum defines this strategy as a while on treatment strategy. But keep in mind, this is not connected to the study treatment. This is connected to your intercurrent event. So really, until you consider all data until the intercurrent event. So how would this prior to occurrence while on treatment strategy look in our example? So for one, uh, you see on the upper right that we are now looking at a different endpoint. We are looking now at best overall response prior to subsequent therapy, because we're only taking into consideration all data up to the intake of subsequent therapy. And that would mean patient four had a best response um, of only SD up to subsequent therapy. And patient five had a PR. And you see again here that the treatment effect is here integrated, or the subsequent therapy is integrated into the variable definition. So uh, this while on treatment strategy modifies the endpoint to best over response prior to subsequent therapy. And in the look of the estimate, we have changed uh, the variable attribute in this while on treatment strategy. There's a fifth strategy, uh, which is um, an, a strategy that can be described as we make the intercurrent event part of the target population definition. And the population is defined by those whom the intercurrent event would or would not occur. And that is described as the principal stratum strategy. We have to be very careful with the principal stratum strategy because intercurrent events are defined as after treatment initiation. So uh, it's not a, a subset definition that we can apply um, easily because uh, we cannot rely on the randomization to still work. So the principal stratum uh, strategy really needs care and often special design um, considerations to be properly applied. Um, it often requires something like a lead-in phase or a phase that really accounts um, for that as well as the intercurrent event. For the same reason, the, the principal stratum strategy cannot meaningfully apply it to our example here. So um, there's no picture on that. And it really needs special considerations. And our working group has published on the principal stratum strategy. And you're happily uh, invited to, to, to read up on that. But I think it's something 
something that we cannot uh, fully cover in, in this webinar. So that's the, uh, the five strategies. And seemingly they come to five different answers. So you see here uh, the outcome of the irrespective of uh, the treatment policy, uh, where uh, both control and drug look exactly the same. Uh, you see the composite strategy where we had no responder, like only SD or the intercurrent events in the control group and two responders in the drug X group. So very positive for drug X. We have the hypothetical scenario where we try to impute the values or the prior to occurrence while on treatment strategy, where we also see a difference in, in the two groups. So the question is, do they provide five different answers? Well, yes and no. They provide five different answers, but they provide answers to different questions. And I think that's the important part about the ICH-9 addenda. And as Ju Wei highlighted, we have to address the right questions. So all these strategies address, address different questions. So you, you should align on your question and then define the strategy that fits to your question. And so there is no universal correct strategy, but your team can align on the correct question. And then there's a high likelihood that there is a correct strategy that reflects uh, your clinical question. And also the, the estimate framework helps to make these implicit assumption transparent that your complete study team is aligned together with uh, sponsors and regulators so everyone who reads up on your estimate really knows how you handle these different strategies and if we turn back to our real life example we had more intercurrent events and the this the approach is the same so you identify in your planning phase um, what intercurrent events you expect, and then you plan for them and align a suitable strategy for them that fits to the ultimate question that you should answer. And with that, uh, I will hand over back to Ju Wei, who, and she will um, continue our journey through the Checkmate 37 study. Okay. Um, so thanks, Stefan. And after Stefan had introduced the estimate framework and different strategies to address intercurrent events, let's now go back to the Checkmate 37 example and see if the estimate framework could help us to address the questions on the two analyses we've seen before. So uh, just a quick re refresh, uh, the Checkmate 37 investigated the treatments for patients with advanced melanoma and it's a randomized controlled open label phase three trial. Um, so remember the primary objective of Checkmate 37 is to show uh, superiority in overall survival in the volume map over chemotherapy. But um, what exactly does that mean? So recall um, that there were two observations in the Checkmate 37. First, there is a large proportion of patients who opted out of prescribed um, treatment. And second, many patients received other checkmate inhibitor therapy post treatment. So, under the ESMAN framework, both uh, can be considered as intercurrent events. And in the primary analysis, both intercurrent events were ignored, actually. And that assumes whatever happens after randomization reflects clinical practice. And they did not anticipate treatment switching to drugs uh, with the same mechanism of action. So the data collected after treatment switching or you know, uh, after these two intercurrent events will be used as is. Therefore, both intercurrent events were handled by the treatment policy strategy. And the clinical question of interest is then, what is the survival benefit after prescription of nivolumab versus chemotherapy, regardless of whether patients take assigned treatment or receive other therapy? So in this case, we are looking at the clinical practice, which means anything happens after randomization will happen in reality. If we further define the estimate that includes five attributes, next slide, please. It is the treatment effect of nivolumab compared with investigator's choice chemotherapy for patients with advanced 
melanoma who progressed on or after a flame map measured by the hazard ratio or overall survival, regardless of whether patients take assigned treatment or receive other therapy. If we think about the five attributes in, an, in this estimate, we have population highlighted in red, that is patients with advanced melanoma who progressed or on or after uh, aflimumab, and treatment highlighted in uh, navy, that is the nivolumab and uh, chemotherapy. Variable is over survival in green, and summary measures has a ratio in purple, and two intercurrent events with strategies in yellow. So now let's see in the post hoc analysis. Uh, next slide, please. The intercurrent events were handled differently. For the first intercurrent event, patient opted out of prescribed treatment. The post hoc analysis um, analyzed only patients who received the randomized treatment. That is, they removed patients who did not receive randomized treatment. Well, this is basically a subgroup analysis, and it is difficult to trace back the strategy uh, given such analysis. Therefore, it is not clear what the estimate it targets, and that's why we leave it as an open question here. And regarding the second intercurrent event, the survival data was censored at the time of other checkpoint inhibitor treatment, which means they assume patients took other therapy similar to those who did not take, or in other words, assume the patients had not started other checkpoint inhibitor therapy, which is considered as hypothetical strategy. Therefore, the question of interest becomes survival benefit after treatment with nivolumab versus chemotherapy if patients never received follow-up checkmate, uh, checkpoint inhibitor uh, therapy treatment. So we see the primary and the post hoc analysis answer totally different clinical question of interest. Without estimate framework, we might not notice that and just treat them as different statistical analysis. So if we further define the estimate for the post hoc analysis that includes five attributes, it would be the treatment effect of nivolumab compared with invest investigators twice chemotherapy for treated patients with advanced melanoma who progressed on or after aflimumab measured by the hazard ratio of overall survival. If patients in chemo arm never received checkpoint inhibitor treatment, Again, the five attributes are highlighted in the same color according to the estimate framework uh, in the right introduced by Stefan. So now we are looking at a different estimate. We are interested in the subset of treated patients and assume patients had not received other checkpoint inhibitor treatment. So other attributes remain the same as the, as the estimate for the primary analysis. Next slide, please. So from checkmate 37, we see the importance of using estimate framework. Before the estimate error, uh, the interpretation of efficacy findings are usually discussed in the context of handling of missing data and analysis methods. While under estimate framework, it is recognized that different analysis may answer different clinical question of interest. Therefore, we highly suggest the clinical trial team to sit down and discuss estimate in your trial when developing the protocol to consider what intercurrent events might happen during the trial and how that could impact the interpretation of the treatment effect. With that, um, I will hand back to uh, Stefan. Yeah, thanks, Chu Wei. So thanks for introducing um, the, uh, or like revisiting the Checkmate 37 study. With that, we will go to the interactive part of this webinar. And we will first have a couple of questions that more target the theory around the, um, the estimate framework. And then uh, we will introduce a second case study. And then you can apply this knowledge that you gain throughout this presentation to uh, a second case study. So uh, stay tuned for that. We will start with a fairly easy question in the beginning. So uh, can, we, can we get poll number one? So the first question is, uh, what primary role is responsible for defining the, es the, the estimate? Is it the statistician, the clinic, clinician, the regulatory person, or the study team? So select the, the answer um, and then click on submit in, in Zoom.
And I think we can get already the results for, th for this question. Okay. So uh, we see the most um, selected answer in, in red, which is uh, the study team, uh, which is also the considered correct answer for this question. Um, because we acknowledge that the ICAG9 addendum was published as an addendum to the statistical guides, the E9 guides. So most of what we've seen also in different pharma companies is that the statistician or like the data sciences groups drive the development of the estimate. But as a statistician, you will not be it will not be possible to fully define the estimate by yourself because you would need to make sure that the whole study team is aligned on the strategies for the intercurrent events. And for that reason, you really need the complete study team uh, to define the estimate. And with that, I would like to move to the second question, um, still a general question. So this time the question is around when should we develop the estimates? So estimates should be discussed and developed during the protocol development, after the, stat the protocol has been finalized, but prior to finalizing the statistical analysis plan, or after finalizing the statistical analysis plan, but prior to unblinding. So select the right answer and then submit. I think I give you a couple more seconds. Yeah, and then we see the, the outcome. So most have selected during protocol development and it, that is also what the advocate um, in, in this session. So the estimate should be defined and selected and then written down in, in the protocol to, to really make sure that all uh, involved parties are aligned on your trial objectives. A couple have selected after the protocol has been finalized, but prior to finalizing the statistical analysis plan. Uh, that could be an option. And that could be an option if your protocol was uh, finalized prior to the ICAG9 addendum. You might want to consider if you want to introduce the estimate language into your statistical analysis plan. We also, this working group has also spent a lot of thoughts on um, what we, how the estimate framework can help us during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And Casper uh, was one of uh, the, the persons who drive that effort. So I'm inviting Casper. Maybe you can say a couple of words uh, on the views on how the estimate framework helps in the ICH, in, in the, the helped us in the pandemic. Um, yes. So as we all know, the pandemic hit uh, surprisingly, and many clinical trials were ongoing at the time. But now, due, due to the pandemic, new intercurrent events uh, happened that we didn't pre-specify in the protocol, uh, such as um, an infection with COVID-19 can be an intercurrent event. Uh, a patient dying from COVID-19 can be an intercurrent event. An intercurrent event can also be, you have a lockdown, you cannot travel to your hospital, so you stop treatment because of COVID-19. And um, I think without the estimated addendum, the discussion how to deal with these kind of clinical events that we faced in many clinical trials would have been very, very difficult and, and chaotic, I think, and, and much more confusing. And the estimate addendum gave us a framework in which we could very quickly assess, acknowledge, and appreciate these intercurrent events and assess their impact on the original clinical objective of the trials that were already running when the pandemic hit. And I, I can just speak for my personal experience. Uh, I, I, I met a lot of people who were initially skeptical about the value of the addendum and is it not just overly complicating things. But when they saw how the addendum was useful in assessing the impact of COVID-19, 
uh, I think they very well understood that the benefits of the addendum and the SDMAN framework. And uh, this working group has um, uh, written a paper on how you can assess the impact of the pandemic on your oncology trial, and that's available uh, on our webpage, or just email me if you're interested. Thanks, Kasper. And with that, we would move to our first a bit more tricky question. Um, so can we have the next question? This question is about uh, common intercurrent events for oncology clinical trials. So um, common intercurrent events uh, for oncology clinical trials include, um, this is a multiple choice answer. Um, possible options are uh, death due to COVID, uh, start of new anti-cancer therapy, premature discontinuation from treatment, withdrawal from study, as well as concomitant radi radiation. So please select um, the multiple answers that you think are correct and then submit your results. I think I give people a couple of more seconds to think here. I would also remind the audience, and I've seen that you have used that already, um, to post questions in the uh, in the Q and A um, box. We will answer them. So the panelists will answer them in writing live. Uh, if you would like to get further details, please raise your question again, and we can pick this up at um, a, a later discussion phase. And I think now we can get the results. Okay. So the most prominent answer is highlighted in, in this orange color, uh, which we most often can, um, can include as an intercurrent event in oncology clinical trials, which is start of new anti-cancer therapy. Um, it's not that clear cut with other events. So premature discontinuation from treatment. Um, I think a general recommendation can be that, that you can consider this as an intercurrent event. So we would include that as, a, as an answer. Um, the first category, so death due to COVID-19, 72% have selected that. So I think the, the, my answer has to be a bit more gray here. So most oncology studies uh, treat death due to any cause as um, an intercar, like as part of the variable or in the estimate framework, um, you can say it's used in a combined strategy. So examples include if you have overall survival, death is part of your endpoint. If you have progression-free survival, death is part of your endpoint. Or you could say death is included in a composite strategy into your progression endpoint. And in these cases, death due to COVID would be included in that bag. It might also be helpful, as Casper said, if you have a lot of deaths due to COVID, to maybe think about another strategy, like a hypothetical strategy, where you ask, well, what would have happened if the pandemic had not occurred? And then you would treat this as a different intercurrent event. Um, the, the next in line is withdrawal from study. So for withdrawal from study, I was selected as an intercurrent event by 78% of uh, the participants. And there, the ICH9 addendum is quite clear that withdrawal from study is not an intercurrent event. So what is the reasoning behind that? So first note that it's withdrawal from study. It's not withdrawal from study treatment. So withdrawal from study normally only occurs uh, due to loss to follow up um, and similar reasons. And in these cases, like loss to follow up, withdrawal from study leads to missing data. And the ICAG9 addendum also clarifies that we have here a missing data problem and not an intercurrent event problem. However, if you have a lot of withdrawal from study, it could be that there is a reason why these patients uh, withdraw from study. So the reason why they withdraw from study 
that could be an intercurrent event. So for example, premature discontinuation from treatment due to an adverse event may result into the same patients like restored from study completely. So your premature discontinuation due to adverse event would then be um, an intercurrent event that you should consider, but you should per ICH9 addendum, not consider restored from study as an intercurrent event. Um, concomitant radiation um, was selected by 74%. Um, I think um, it can be helpful to include that as an intercurrent event because intercurrent event identification only means you make it transparent of what you do with that intercurrent event. If you use the treatment policy strategy on that intercurrent event, it, it would imply that you um, analyze irrespective of that intercurrent event, but you make it transparent that you think that concomitant uh, radiation will not influence your endpoint. Or if you want to apply any of the other strategies, uh, then you can be transparent of what you're doing as well. So, so far, this was more a general uh, rehearsal. And you have seen uh, how Juwe has constructed uh, estimates. And we would now like to give you the chance to apply this knowledge to a second case study. And the second case study uh, will be uh, in hematology. So we apply it here to acute myeloid leukemia, AML. And as for other hematologic malignancies, treatments are often given here in a sequence. Um, so you often have a sequence of induction, consolidation, and maintenance, which makes your study design more complicated and uh, also introduces some potential other intercurrent events. And we have here um, the case that the patients get offered stem cell transplantation, SCT, as an option which is uh, potentially curative and can be offered to like half of your uh, population or, or trial participants. On the other hand, uh, stem cell transplantation is associated with significant complications as well as a um, 15 to 20% uh, mortality rate. So you have to consider that and often there are like new classes of drugs available that also provide new options after treatment failure. And in general, you can say specific topics, or in this case, a specific indication with unique uh, points to it, uh, requires a dedicated consideration in the estimate framework. And we will do this. And we look here at the Ratify study, um, which was. Um, a study that uh, assessed newly diagnosed AML patients with an FLT3 mutation. The primary objective was to determine if the addition of midotosaurin to induction consolidation and maintenance therapy improves the overall survival. So overall survival is our our endpoint. It's a phase three randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled study. You can see uh, the layout of the study down below here. We had a one-to-one -one randomization of 717 patients with FLT3 mutation, um, either to treatment or to placebo. And you see here in this red color that they were offered optional stem cell transplantation uh, when clinically indicated. And I leave this design here open and I would then invite, um, can we please have the first question to that? And the first question is about a potential estimate that we can build. So, Remember, the, the primary objective was to determine um, if the addition of treatment to induction, consolidation, and maintenance therapy improves overall survival. And for that estimate, what would be um, the components of uh, the estimate? Would it be the sample size, uh, the treatments, the endpoint uh, as prescription of how to handle 
um, the occurrence of post-randomization events, the, the intercurrent events, uh, the final p-value, the population of interest, or a population level sum. So please um, select the attributes of the estimate, and I give you like 10 more seconds because this is. Okay, so make sure to send your final selection and then can we get the results? Okay, so the, the first aspect that we should remember is that the estimate considers of five components. So if you have selected five components, that's good. And the components uh, that were introduced in the estimate framework, they all target the, the what we estimate. So it's the components are the treatment, the endpoint, a description of the intercurrent events, the population of interest, and the population level sum. And it does not include the how we do it. And part of the how is the sample size, as well as the final p-value. And also, if you remember, we had the distinction between the estimate, uh, the estimator, and the estimate. And the final p-value would be closer to your numerical outcome. So it would be more on the estimate level and not on the estimate level. The estimate is... Um, what you want to estimate. Okay, um, and then we have an, a next question. And also keep in mind, um, in parallel to, uh, to answering these questions, you can post questions in the Q&A box. So, the primary estimate in the Ratify study considered overall survival regardless of receiving stem cell transplantation. So um, we have seen that a lot of subjects receive stem cell transplantation. So that is an intercurrent event that we considered. And if they use this regardless of stem cell transplantation, what would be the intercurrent event strategy that was applied? Was it a hypothetical strategy? a treatment policy strategy, a composite strategy, or a while on treatment strategy. And then we also invite you to select which intercurrent event strategy would you have applied for stem cell transplantation? So would you have used a hypothetical strategy, a treatment policy strategy, a composite strategy, a while on treatment strategy, or would you have uh, use none of those and, for example, censored overall survival after stem cell um, transplant. So make one choice for uh, question one and one choice um, for question two, and then submit your answers. As we have two questions, I give you five more seconds and then can pull up the results. Okay. So the regardless of um, stem cell transplantation, um, that is, um, is also the ITT principle. So it's connected to the ITT principle which means you consider everything that happens afterwards as part of clinical care. And that is reflected in ICH-9 as a treatment policy strategy. So treatment policy uh, would, would be the corresponding strategy to the regardless of um, assessment. And for the second one, so we see uh, a mixed bag of everything. So, um, some would favor a hypothetical strategy, some would favor a treatment policy strategy, uh, a composite strategy was selected by most, or a while on treatment strategy. So 
I think that highlights uh, that, for example, if the ratify study had had not precisely defined what they would do with the stem cell transplantation, it could have resulted in, in different interpretations because um, people that have selected these different options, and all of them are valid options, um, may have correctly or incorrectly assumed that all on the study team have the same understanding. So for example, one study team member uh, could have had the assumption that of course stem cell transplantation is a negative outcome and should be accounted for as that, so in a composite strategy, for example. And other, steam, uh, other team members, um, well, wanted to apply a treatment policy strategy. And maybe this was then also later defined in the statistical analysis plan. And then you have a disconnect between the assumption of what should have been applied to what was actually applied. And there's really the benefit of the ICH United Addendum because it surfaces um, these discussion, it brings them up early at the design phase, and it hopefully makes sure that everyone on the study team is aligned on the strategy. So, so far, I, I have talked about the last option, which is we censor overall survival after stem cell transplantation. So, Jue has touched base on that, uh, during the checkpoint uh, 37 case example. So what do we actually do when we censor overall survival after stem cell transplantation? We assume that the hazard of these patients is the same or remains constant after the censoring. So what we do, we apply uh, the hypothetical assumption that the hazard uh, would have not changed if they hadn't gotten the stem cell transplantation. So in the, in the estimate framework, uh, this censoring for an intercurrent event of censoring for stem cell transplantation is actually a hypothetical strategy. So the last option to censor for overall survival is a subset of the hypothetical strategies. And that is um, an understanding that has really surfaced only through the ICH-9 addendum. And to some extent, uh, we have also like um, relearned what we do here. So when we censor, we really apply um, a simple hypothetical strategy. Okay. And then we bring up uh, the last uh, question which is also collect, connected to our learning objectives. So what are the benefits of the estimate framework? And I hope you have uh, enjoyed them during this presentation. Is it to promote alignment between trial objectives, design, data collection, and analysis of inference? Increase transparency over what is being measured. Increase uh, the number of analysis required. Um, or provides clear language to discuss the different objectives for different stakeholders, strengthens the interdisciplinary dialogue at the design stage. So please select um, the appropriate answers. This is again, a multiple choice. And then remember to submit as well. Remember to, to post any uh, questions uh, you might have in the chat the checkbox. Okay, so most have selected the anticipated answers. Some feel that there is an increase in the number of analysis required. Um, yeah, I think this is a fair critic um, that was often raised with the ICH-9 addendum. And even so, the ICH-9 addendum has the, the exact opposite. So the idea is to align everyone and then have a single, hopefully, or like a single, only a few analysis 
that target your your clinical question of interest and not have multiple analysis that target different questions um but that is something and that we will uh yeah, that it was anticipated. And I think it, it's, it also will come with more and more knowledge that we gained to the estimate framework to appreciate uh, the benefits. And Casper has also acquired some connection to the uh, ICAG9 working group, and maybe he can also share uh, some more knowledge um, from them, like on some of the caveats that the ICAG9 addendum has received. Um, I think in general, um, that the uh, addendum is, is very well received. And just for everybody's uh, information, the FDA has officially published the final version about two or three weeks ago. Uh, and with that, I think all major health authorities are, are to the best of my knowledge, on board with this. And more and more, the framework is asked for in health authority interactions. So if you go with your trial proposal to an authority, they want to discuss the estimate with you. And uh, it will not just be a discussion among the statisticians on the table, it will be a discussion with the whole trial team. What is your scientific objective? What estimate do you derive from that? Um, of course, if you if you the ICH uh, original E9 guideline has been in effect for 20 years, and that speaks to the robustness of that guideline. And now that you amend it and, and suggest some changes, of course, not everybody will initially agree, and maybe also during over time, not everybody will agree. You could say handle things differently, uh, but in my personal opinion, this is really a step in the right direction. And uh, when you start applying it on on a broad scale you realize how much things you have left open in the past, how much heterogeneity you have introduced in trials, um, uh, how many discussions we had that could have been easily avoided if, and that was one of the questions today, if we had discussed at the protocol design stage, even at the protocol synopsis stage, what is our estimate? And uh, very often we, we, we tend to shy away from that discussion and push it to later, but the work has to be done at some point. And if you only do the work, when you have collected the data at the filing stage and you disagree with the health authority and they want something from you for which you haven't collected the data, then it is very, very late to do that work. So let's do that work at the design stage. And we, it will be paid back later because the, the whole process afterwards hopefully will become much, much smoother. And that's also what we experience. So I really encourage everybody involved in clinical trials discuss and clarify the estimate, clarify the buy-in from all relevant stakeholders at the design stage as early as possible. Yeah, and I think that is, so what Kasper mentioned, I think the question is, is the estimate framework applied? Um, I think more and more health authorities will ask for it. And it's a fair question. And I think we can also look uh, beyond oncology to other indications. And with that, I will, uh, hand over to uh, Giovanna, who uh, will make some concluding remarks prior to the, the general question and answer session and talk about this point as well. Thanks, Stefan. So my name is Giovanna and I'm a clinician. I work for Novartis and I'll guide you through the last three slides of this presentation, which we hope you have enjoyed. And thanks for being with us um, this morning. So as you can see, the estimate is not something uh, that has uh, still to come. It's, it's already in our trials and, um, you know, the three trials shown here, uh, you know, include the estimate in their, um, in their design and have been designed, including the estimates. Um, can I have this next slide? And as has been uh, several times, I guess, uh, stressed during this presentation, the construction of the estimate is a multidisciplinary undertaking and should be the subject of, of discussion between sponsors and regulators. So not only uh, the estimate should be constructed within the clinical team, so involving all line function, clinician, statistician, and other um, functions, but also, of course, interaction, as um, Casper was just mentioned, with the regulators and the SDA committees. 
And next slide. There's two uh, webinars which are coming soon. One is on the respiratory case study and the other one is using estimate in trials developing COVID vaccine. So there's more to come. And um, with this, I think this was the last slide. Yeah, I don't know if you do have any other question, you can feel free to type in the Q&A. Yeah, so please take the opportunity. We have 10 more minutes and uh, we saw a couple of questions. Uh, please type any questions you have in, in the Q&A and we will uh, then try to answer them during this last session. So I invite all our panelists to, to switch their videos on, and then we, we can have a, a last 10 minute discussion on the remaining comments. There was uh, one comment that I saw is, for, isn't the while on treatment strategy and the hypothetical strategy similar as it, it censors uh, the data at a specific point? That is um, a fair question, and I think this question occurs especially in oncology, and I think there is a, dif a distinction between um, time point based variables as in, in, in the overall response rate that we saw in, in, in the checkpoint. Uh, 37 study uh, compared to a time to event endpoint and the uh, the distinction on the, the, the like the different strategies for time to event endpoint like overall survival is a bit more complicated i think the art you can argue that it's both a hypothetical strategy or it's a while on treatment strategy and it then really depends on how you want to estimate uh, this strategy. And most often, if you apply the methods um, to time to event endpoints, you often assume um, constant hazards after um, the censoring, and therefore you apply um, implicitly often a hypothetical strategy. So I think um, there, is, there is some argument that can be made where this can be considered a, a hypothetical strategy, but for a time to have an endpoint that can also be an argument made while this is a, a while on treatment strategy. Um, as a group, we would uh, more uh, put the while on treatment strategy um, in the area of a palliative setting uh, where you have death not as a negative outcome, but something that will occur. And in a palliative setting, you're interested in what happened before. And there you would consider death with a, a while on treatment strategy. And yeah, and I think we have a couple of more questions. So I'll read out one. Is the estimate framework also applied to phase one or phase two studies? Um, I would like to take that one because I work in oncology early development. Um, so the ICH nine addendum is written I think primarily in mind with the randomized studies, but it states that the, the, this, the core principle applied to each phase and, and, and each study. And it also mentioned that it applies to single arm studies as well, which are often used in phase one oncology studies. And I think the question is, is not really, does it need to be applied? I think part of the question is really, does it help? And I think it helps because it makes implicit assumption transparent. You talk with your trial team. What do you do if in your phase one study they take subsequent therapy? Um, it, it, it just helps, as Casper mentioned, to align the team on specific questions. And within our working group, we have just started a new uh, task force that especially tackles uh, phase one studies. And there we're also discussing if how can the estimate framework help in the, the early dose escalation where you have also DLTs as, as one of the endpoints. And there, there's more to come. And I think we have reached a full, um, full alignment there as well. We're just gathering the knowledge between the, com the companies. So a next question is, will there be webinars on estimators to implement the strategies? Um, 
Judith, uh, does your working group have um, any plans for that? Maybe you want to take that one. Yes, I mean, the aim of the webinars is to, to use real case studies to show how to implement the, um, the estimate framework. So in all of them, you will see different real life examples. And in the ones that Giovanna has presented, in the respiratory case, we already has, have a, um, um, a real case from AstraZeneca. And we're looking for examples for the COVID-19 trials. Yeah. And we have another question on uh, the, the use of the framework in real world evidence. And I see Casper typing an answer. So maybe he want to, can you speak on that one? We have a yeah, couple so, of minutes. Yeah, um, so that was also the spirit of, of additional questions. Is this only something for phase three randomized trials? And my answer to that would be a clear no. Um, whenever we are interested in quantifying a treatment effect, the estimate framework or related frameworks, you might have heard of the target trial framework, they can help us to specify what we are actually after. So, and for that reason, we have a task force within the working group who is working on examples and making them available, illustrating the benefit of applying the framework to real world data questions as well. Um, and also at Roche, we are, are starting to apply the framework to real world data questions. And while not always you are able to clearly identify a causal S demand, I mean, that is the ultimate goal of the framework. Very often it still helps to structure the problem in your head and within the team. So I very much encourage, always consider applying it. And there is not, it must be done or it must not be done. The question I invite everybody to consider is more, is it useful for our purpose, yes or no? And if it's useful, then use it, uh, even if it's not mentioned in the addendum. So, and, and in my experience, very often it is useful. And next question is, is there some kind of replacement of the previous standard approach to do an ITT analysis versus a protocol set analysis as a sensitivity? So I think the, the, uh, the chance that we have with the ICHG9 addendum is, to not use these like historically um, developed approaches uh, that were also published in some of the guidances, but to really apply this framework to identify intercurrent events and then select the appropriate strategy. And if you select, as they did in Checkpoint 37, uh, a treatment policy strategy for each of your intercurrent event, you will result more or less in an ITT analysis. And I think uh, there are already quite some reservations with the per protocol analysis. And um, I think our general recommendation is to move away from a per protocol analysis and really apply um, a different method. And I think that is also what Juwe struggled a bit, whether in the Checkmate 37 study, they used the treated patients only, uh, which can well, which is difficult to, to incorporate into the estimate framework. And um, yeah, so that it, it, some, some new questions will arise and then often you get uh, better answers. So it may have been better to use a hypothetical strategy there and model what would have happened if those subjects were treated. And maybe Zhu Wei, um, I know that we had these discussions when preparing the slides, so maybe you want to add uh, on that. Uh, yes, yes, Stefan. So, so I think from my point of view, the in nine uh, the the estimate framework is not uh, in terms of ITT. It's not uh, in terms like, you know encouraging it or leaving uh, or saying we are leaving from it. It's just like uh, if we are trying to do something like ITT, like treatment policy, then we want to do a true ITT rather than, you know, we say we are doing ITT, but actually, you know, um, we are treating those intercurrent events differently. And uh, of course there are some, I see some other questions similar, like whether the pro protocol analysis still uh, can be done. I think, yeah, based on the um, in addendum, it's obviously, you know, not encouraged, at least a naive, Per protocol analysis is not encouraged because some of the protocol deviations are not considered as intercurrent events. So that will be already incorporated in the estimate framework. 
Yeah, and I think one question that I saw as well was um, if they included only the treated patients in Checkmate 37, is that a principal stratum strategy? So, Juwei, can you comment on that yeah. as well? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, that, I think for this example, um, we are trying to trace back the estimate for some analysis, which is, of course, difficult. But if we are at the stage of design this study, then of course, principal stratum could be one of the option we consider. Like if that is the question, um, like we interested, um, we are interested in the patients who will not, you know, uh, opted out of the prescribed treatment. And for that kind of uh, question of interest, then probably some study design like run in period would be required um, to at least, uh, you know, uh, avoid uh, too large a proportion of missing data, and also uh, in terms of analysis, uh, more advanced uh, statistical analysis will be required, like causal inference approach. And I also see another relevant uh, question saying, you know, there always be strong assumptions for the principal stratum strategy. Yes, um, yeah, for those strong assumptions, then sensitivity analysis uh, needs to be considered. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thanks, Jiwei. So um, I see a couple of open questions. We will follow up, um, as Kasper mentioned in the beginning, um, uh, via, via email uh, or like post them on the web website. Um, as a final comment, so the slides and, and the recording will be available on the, the PSI websites. You can also find further details on uh, ongestimate.org. I would also uh, thank Emily, who you haven't seen from, from PFI, PSI, who um, managed all the background and pulled up the questions and, and things like that. She managed all the, the technical aspects of the webinar. Highly appreciated. And if there are any follow-up questions to this webinar, please go to oncoestimate.org um, and please um, you find their contact details and reach out to our working group. Yeah, thank you. And I thank all my, my speakers as well. Thank you, thanks all.